Well, we've been uh, encountering, we've been walking with Jesus as he's encountered many different people on the way to the cross in Jerusalem. And we have really made it to that point. This is Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday, also known as Passion Sunday as well, as often the reflection is both on the waving of the palms and the parade of welcoming, but also on the passion of Jesus Christ as well. Last week, we were in a little place called Bethany. Bethany was just about 1.8 miles, I think I read somewhere, on the east side of the Mount of Olives, 1.8 miles from Jerusalem. is really close. And last week, where you remember, there was a family who loved Jesus that threw a party for him, a dinner party, to give thanks for Jesus Christ. And that was Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Lazarus had just been raised from the dead. People had come to believe. And the ladies were excited about what had happened to their brother Lazarus. And so they give a party. It was there at that party that Mary pours out that it was a year's wages, a year's worth of perfume she poured on the feet of Jesus. One, the gospel says, on his head, recognizing again, they would anoint a priest coming on, on the head. And here comes the great high priest, but anointing on the feet because it was a sacrificial, extravagant gift pointing symbolically to us that Jesus was now coming to be the sacrifice. So great high priest, sacrificial lamb, we'll look at. And then finally, he's coming as the king, the real king, the true king. And that's the triumphal entry. And I'll read those. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there to Mark 11. And it says these words, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you doing this, tell him the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. Now, all this was done to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah, and so Jesus knows exactly where this donkey uh, is. And uh, when they see the fulfillment of it, it's pointing to Christ again. And so the disciples, it says, they went and found a colt outside in the street tied at the doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying the colt? And they answered as Jesus had told them to. And the people let them go. And when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut off in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, which simply means save us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And Jesus entered Jerusalem, and he went to the temple, and he looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you again that you have sent Jesus to us. And Jesus, thank you for coming to Jerusalem. And thank you again for being here today. Thank you for coming for your people. Thank you for coming today for your people, for us. And as we again look at this passage and see who Jesus is, I pray, Lord, that people's hearts can be touched. I thank you for Laura who has given her life to you. And I pray that if there's someone else here that that needs to know you as Lord and Savior, that your spirit will just descend. And as we share today, your spirit will draw. We pray, come, not only for salvation, but come and heal us. Come, restore us. Come, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, two days before what we call this uh, wonderful triumphal entry of Palm Sunday. Again, Jesus was in Bethany, and that's where Mary, Martha, and uh, Lazarus were in that dinner. But now it's two days later, and they're on the move, and it tells us that the disciples and Jesus are going to a place called Bethphage, or Bethpage, which simply means house of figs. That's an interesting name, this house of figs, because on Monday of Holy Week, Jesus, after leaving the temple, is going to encounter a fig tree that should have been at least in in bloom enough that it would have a piece of candy delicacy that would become a whole fig soon. But since he opens the leaf up because he was hungry and doesn't find anything there, there was nothing coming, he cursed the tree. One of the weirdest, kind of unusual things, he curses the fig tree. 
was basically symbolic of the fact that the church, the way it was set up, and religion had just become religion. And what should have been happening for the Lord wasn't happening, and there was no fruit. And that's why. And so this is a special place, Bethpage. But now I want to show you on a, a map that's going to come up, so we'll go there. And this is actually the route of the triumphal entry. So Bethany again is where Mary and Martha and Lazarus were, and Jesus has traveled a little bit over a mile, and he gets to the page, Bethpage again, House of Figs. And it's only, you'll notice the House of Figs is actually on part of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is the 2,600 high, uh, feet high mountain that looks down on Jerusalem or over to Jerusalem. And on the eastern side is Bethphage. Bethphage was three quarters of a mile from the temple in Jerusalem. And that's important. You could walk that in about 15 or 20 minutes, even though it's hilly. It might take a little longer, just three quarters of a mile. In fact, today in Jerusalem, if you see on the news, you might see massive palm branches, and the people will walk this path from Beth Page down to, to the temple as well in honor of, of Jesus coming again and who Jesus is today. And so that's where the story begins and takes place. And what's interesting about it starting there is that there is a whole lot of noise, a whole lot of commotion that's coming from the east side of the Mount of Olives. And the reason it's so noisy is for several days now, a throng of pilgrims have been walking down from Galilee and from other parts of Judea and even from other countries. They've been coming to Jerusalem once again, that yearly event called Passover. They've come to celebrate Passover. Now, at the time of Passover in Jerusalem, the population would go from a 100,000 people, some say to a quarter million, half million, some researchers even say as many as a million people would come, be coming to Jerusalem. Now imagine, that's a noisy throng. If you took everybody in greater Metro Louisville, that's about a million people. Imagine us all getting together on one side of the Mount of Olives, prepared to go in to Jerusalem. But it's not only noisy because there's a whole bunch of people there getting ready to go in, but they're doing something else as well. They are singing, and they're singing songs of ascent. Um, and that's what they'd do. They'd start coming through the mountains, and they would sing as they came to Jerusalem. In fact, you can go to your Bible, Psalm 120 through 134. They are all songs, and it'll say at the top, a song of ascent, as you would send them out of the Temple Mount. And so they're singing these songs. Now, when you have that many people, there's trouble for those who are oppressing the people. And we got to understand something, that while the people were coming to Passover to celebrate deliverance from slavery and bondage of Egypt, the people actually weren't free, were they? They weren't free. In fact, now instead of Egypt holding them in bondage, the Romans have them in bondage. So they're still in bondage. And Rome wanted to make sure the people, the Jewish people, knew they were in bondage. And there was a couple of reasons, too, uh, beside that. When you have a big commotion of about a million people, it's crowd control problems. But there's also the problem of what songs the people were singing. And one of the songs they would sing in the Song of Ascent was this one. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous. Let Israel say they have greatly oppressed me from my youth. Now, that doesn't sound just like Hosanna Save a song, does it? That sounds like Rome's holding the scepter, and Rome's over us, and we've been oppressed. Now, Herod and Pontius Pilate are three quarters of a mile away, and if you take a million people singing that song, I'm almost guarantee you they can hear it. I asked this morning, how many of you have ever sung with a million people before? Anybody done it? We, we did it when we went to Stand in the Gap, 1997 in Washington, D.C. A million men gathered there. And I want to tell you, it was one of the in, most incredible sounds of hearing the song go up. And I know it had to, it had to reverberate for blocks and blocks and blocks through Washington, D.C. And so here's poor old Herod and Pilate. Guess what? We got a million people coming in. And guess what? They're singing songs of revolution, like songs of overthrow. We got some problems. And so to make sure they, the people were 
put in check and stayed in that bondage, so to say, they would marshal in hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of extra Roman troops to make sure no riot broke out as well. And that's the backdrop of what takes place. But here's the thing. There was an oppressor, and that oppressor was Rome. Today there's an oppressor. We would say his name is Satan. And there might be those of us here today who know all about the songs that we're singing, and we know they're songs of freedom, but we're not always experiencing that freedom of which these songs are about. We too might be among the crowd of worshipers who are going and coming and going and coming, but who aren't really able to worship. Sometimes we can't worship because it's simply the weight of life that bears on us. The pace and the stress of life we live, problems at work, financial problems, other types of problems stress us out. And sometimes we feel like we have no peace and we're in more bondage than peace. For some, we might be doing all the regular things of life. We have jobs. We are raising families. We go to ball games. We watch ball games. Regular life. But we have maybe no peace. And we might just feel lost. And then it might just be the fact that we can't worship because the weight of sin or shame or guilt might be upon us. And so we ask the question, where does our help come from? And that was a question that the Jewish people asked as they came to Passover. Psalm 121 is the second song of ascent. And it's a popular one, and it starts out this way. I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. As the Jewish people, especially the Galileans, made their way through the valleys, they would come to the mountains, and they would begin to sing this song. Because they would look at mountains, and mountains were a reminder to them of God's strength and God's power. Have you ever realized in the Bible how many things happen around a mountain? Mount Hermon, Mount Nebo, just keep listening. But they were, this was the strength of God. And so one thing they were saying, we need your help, and we will look to the mountains for God's help. But there was another mount that they would look at as they would come over the, the, uh, Mount of Olives, and that mount would be the Temple Mount. And they would see the Temple Mount, and the Temple Mount was to always remind them that this is the place of sacrifice. This is the place that on that Thursday following this Sunday, probably 200,000 lambs will lose their life, and blood's going to flow all over that Temple Mount, and it would be a reminder, a stark reminder to these people that something died in your place, and blood flowed everywhere, and it was the reminder of forgiveness of sin. Lord, where do we, we lift up our eyes to the hills, and it's the mountains, and the temple mount as well. But it was beyond that also. They were turning their backs, they were turning their hearts back to home. And that was an important thing. We go back to home, and, and things start to feel different. Um, when I was first married with uh, Sheila, and thankfully I'm still married to Sheila. It'll be 32 years in May. But when we were first married, and we would make that trip twice a year back to Pensacola to my folks. And um, we would go during the summer a week and go for Christmas a week. And we would drive those 10 hours or so. But when I got to US 29 and got to a place called Cantonment, Florida, about 30 minutes outside of Pensacola, suddenly it all was starting to feel like home again. You know, I was there, and, I, and, and, and what I knew of home, what I knew of a father's love and a mother's love, it kind of overwhelmed me. Always, it was just that point as we went into Pensacola. And so in the same way, these people, they were turning back home and back to God. But one of the things they struggled with was as they came, they were always longing to see the oppressor get overthrown. And that oppressor happened to be Rome. And so their hope as they cry out, where does my help come from? I'm hoping the Lord's coming to take out the Caesars and to take out the Herods and others. But that's not the way God did it. Jesus now is coming. 
And this day is the, the day of his declaration that he is the rightful king. Remember, before he said, it's not my time. Well, now it's my time. Now I'm coming into Jerusalem. And now I'm coming in, not only as the one who will be the sacrifice and the high priest, but now the king as well. But there's a certain way he comes in. And he tells us in Scripture that Jesus sends two of his disciples to go to a certain place that he already knows about, where that donkey will be there for sure, and it's the fulfillment of prophecy. And it says this in Matthew's Gospel, these words, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Now that was significant to us. It wasn't a horse, but it was a donkey. If, if a leader was coming in to make military conquest, if a leader was coming in in power to overthrow the enemy, if a leader was coming in with his chariots and, and all of those things, he would ride on a horse. And that meant he's coming to make war. But if a king rode in on a donkey, it meant that they were coming in peace and they'd come to make peace. Now the people wanted Jesus to make peace in some sense of the word by coming to make war. But Jesus came to make peace and to offer the real thing they needed and that was peace of the heart. And peace of the heart can overcome, in fact, even when the Herod is still in place and even when all the circumstances are still there of life. Jesus said, I've come to bring peace to your hearts, and so he comes as a king of peace. Now, the people that had come from Galilee were very special to Jesus because for over two years they had seen a lot of the miracles of Jesus. These were the, these were in some sense almost kind of outcasts too to the people of Judea, but they had come great supporters of Jesus. And when Jesus gets the donkey, it says they do two significant things. And the first thing it does is they get the donkey and they place a cloak over it for Jesus to sit down on. The second thing they do is they take all of their cloaks off, the outer garments, and they will make a pathway. If we were having a wedding, one thing we would do is roll down a white carpet here and, and in some sense to, to have the, the, the bride ushered in to be with the groom and so forth. But they would take their outer cloaks and garments off and they would lay them down. And there's an important symbol to that. A person's cloak, at the bottom of it, had tassels on it. And those tassels were the sign of authority. And so when you took your cloak off and laid it down before someone else, it meant that you were submitting to their authority. Remember when Saul was Saul before Paul, and he was murder, you know, putting Christians to death, and one was a famous Christian by the name of Stephen? And Stephen was put to death and it said Saul was there giving the approval. And it said they laid their cloaks at the feet of Saul. It meant those people that day who took Stephen's life were bowing submission to a man named Saul. It was for all the wrong reasons. There's another case of the tassels in authority. How many remember, remember the woman who was bleeding for 12 years? Remember that? The woman with the hemorrhage. It says if you go through all the Gospels, she tried every doctor she could. She spent every penny she had, and absolutely nothing worked. Everything humanly possible didn't work. And yet one day she hears Jesus is coming to town, and she stills up behind him. And you know what she touches? She touches the hem of his garment, or the tassels in the place of authority. And as she bowed at the feet of Jesus, she recognizes to us the real place of healing is right here with Jesus. Jesus is the one who will heal. Will he heal through doctors? Absolutely. Will he heal more than just physically, emotionally? Absolutely. Will he heal the soul? Absolutely. And so she submits to him for healing purposes as well. And so that was significant. They took the cloaks off. But they also took these palm branches. And what's interesting, we, we usually think, and they would wave them, and that's normally what we think. But the scripture said today that they laid these palm branches also and made a path for Jesus Christ. Well, why? In fact, you know, in three of the Gospels, it just said they cut branches. It's John who says they were palm branches. And that was important. A palm was important. Why was it important? Well, eight years previous to this, Herod Antipas about caused a riot because he printed out some coins. And on those coins, he printed Caesar Tiberius's face on it. And the Jewish people would have nothing to do with those coins because that was considered idolatry if you put the image of a person on a coin. And there's no way. 
And, and there was almost a rebellion. And so Herod kind of relented. And he decided, okay, I'll put a palm tree on there. And then he put like a, 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 another symbol showing, hey, we're still over you in authority and you're in slavery. But you know what? The Jewish people said, hey, that's a victory. That's a victory. He, he's showing us the palm. And the palm for the Jewish people was their symbol of nationalism. This wasn't just a palm. If we have a famous person going down the streets uh, that served our country, what do we usually wave? We wave uh, an American flag, right? This was almost like they were raising the, the flag of Israel. I don't think Herod would have liked that too much, by the way. But you know what they were really saying when they took it and put it here? They're saying nothing is over the kingdom of God in some sense of the word. I know people who said, I'm American first and then I'm a Christian, but that's totally backwards. <laughs> We're Christians first. And flowing from that is who we might be beyond that. But they would lay those down in submission to Jesus Christ. But they still thought it was Jesus who was coming to rid them of the authorities. The woman with the hemorrhage touches the place of authority. The people see the place of authority and lay the palm branches down as well. Here comes victory. Here comes victory. But what kind of victory is it? And the people couldn't help themselves. If you look at Luke's gospel, it says they begin to celebrate and shout because they're remembering all the miracles that Jesus did. And so look in that gospel and you'll see they're starting to shout and celebrate. But in a sense, they're crying out from the depths of their hearts, not even what they might know for. They say the word Hosanna. And Hosanna simply means save now. Jesus, would you come in right in this moment and save us now? Would you march down to the temple? Will you rid Herod of his place? Would you rid Pontius Pilate of his grace? Please save us now. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then they say, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. They were recognizing again, that's, a, that's the Davidic word, the Messiah word, is this Messiah that's coming as well. But again, the people were looking for the quick answer of that which was oppressing them. They were in some ways, like the psalmist says, some put their trust in chariots, some in horses, and those were military kinds of things, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They didn't totally understand that. And then we get to a place on the Mount of Olives, and there's a very important passage that comes from Luke's understanding of the triumphal entry, and it says these words, as he, being Jesus, approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said these words as Jesus, can you imagine Jesus weeping? Even if you, even you had only known on this day what would bring you, what's the word? Peace. I mean, I know you're looking for peace in a lot of places. But what will bring you real peace? And I want to show you a church we visited that's on the side of the Mount of Olives near the Garden of Gethsemane. And this church is called Dominus Flevit, if I pronounce that correctly. And it just seem, simply means the Lord wept. They built this church in the 50s, uh, and the architect of this church wanted the church to look like a big teardrop. To remind us as Jesus was looking over Jerusalem, he would begin to weep for Jerusalem. We went inside that church and sat in there and we sang. And when you see, you're looking ahead and you see this window of this church. And then toward the end, after everybody had sung, we moved toward that window. And when you look out the window, what you directly see out that window is the Temple Mount. Now that's the Golden Dome of the mosque, the Muslims over a certain period of time. Then we're over the, basically the, the Mount. But right then would have been the Temple. That's where the Temple was, right there. And what is marked by that church is the fact that Jesus was looking directly at the temple and he was weeping because people did not understand what would bring them real peace. Religion had become religion for religion's sake. And they had lost the message of God in that. Also on that, I think he was weeping. We're going to go to pan out to all of Jerusalem because it said he wept over Jerusalem. These were all shots we took from, from the Mount of Olives. Because he didn't just weep for religion's sake. He was weeping for people who didn't understand. He was weeping for our ignorance. He was weeping for our understanding. He was weeping for our unbelief. He was weeping for our sin. 
not just the sin of Jerusalem. He was weeping for us. Jesus wept. And he stops on his way to triumph to weep for you and me. It might have been 2,000 years ago, but Jesus was weeping for us. And then one of the gospel writers tells us another important thing. He says these words, Jesus' words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. That happened also on the Mount of Olives. And Jesus is looking out at Jerusalem. And he goes, you know, my heart, my heart is I've longed to gather my children under my wings. You really want to know what peace is, Jesus says. It's kind of a strange kind of picture. I heard this uh, illustration. It was, it happened in a, it was after a forest fire in Yellowstone Park several years ago. And one of the forest rangers, as they went to look through all that had burned down in the park and make an assessment of it, one ranger found a bird that had literally was petrified in ashes. This is burnt up, but it was perched kind of like this, statuesquely, and it was right by the base of a tree. The ranger was kind of somewhat sickened. It was an eerie looking thing, this bird of ashes. And, and so he kicked it over to knock it down, only to his surprise to watch three little live chicks run out from under the bird that had been burnt to death. The loving mother, keenly aware of impending disaster just in that natural instinct, had carried her offspring to the base of the tree and had gathered them under her wings. Instinctively, in some way, as a mother might know, that the toxic smoke would rise. She could have flown to safety and saved herself, but she didn't. She refused to abandon her babies. And when the blaze had arrived, the heat that had scorched her body, the mother remained steadfast because she had been willing to die so that under the cover of her wings, the chicks would live. Jesus is not going to abandon us. He made His way to Jerusalem. We call it the triumphal entry. Later this week, later that week, I would like to call it the triumphal exit. Some people will call it the Via Dolorosa. It's the way of suffering. For here in Jerusalem, Jesus would be betrayed by one of His own, sold out for a mere sum of 30 pieces of silver. He would be arrested in His favorite place of private prayer, the Garden of Gethsemane. He would be falsely accused he would be false. Evidence would be produced by people. People lied that in this false trial, he might be found guilty. And the only thing guilty he'd be found of is being the Son of God. While he was on trial, his lead disciple Peter was facing another trial outside, warming his hands, as we know by that fire. When asked if he knew Jesus, he outright denied that he had ever known Jesus Christ. People would spit in the face of Jesus, strike Him with their fists, and given a choice to either let Jesus free or a revolutionary murderer free, the crowd chose the murderer to go free. He was then taken to be flogged, 39 plus lashes, with a cat's tail whip. That was a whip that had five or six different lashes on it. Not just lashes, they would take pieces of bone, they would take sharp metal and anything that was sharp and they would tie to the end of the lashes and tie someone to a post. I heard one of the classes was watching The Passion. It's probably pretty accurate. And then a professional Roman guard who was paid to do this and who knew how to do it well would lash Jesus at least 39 times and the scourge would be so bad it would rip his back open, probably exposing his back, already pouring out the blood. Humiliated. Now, later after all this happened, he would be taken to the guards who would mock him. In fact, the guards actually played a game. It was called the King's Game. They literally played a game with Jesus. They stripped him and placed a purple robe on him and pressed down the crown of thorns on him. They mocked him as king of the Jews. Then they stripped his clothes off of him. They placed a horizontal 
beam of the cross on his shredded back. If he was not in enough excruciating pain, this was probably unbearable almost. In fact, the word crucifixion, where we get that word, crucifixion, is where we get our word excruciating. It was excruciatingly painful for Jesus. And if that wasn't enough, they would parade him through the streets of, streets of Jesus to add to his humiliation and to afflict the greatest amount of shame on Jesus. They marched him outside the city to put him to death because that's where thieves and murderers and revolutionaries and sinners, you were always put to death outside the city gates. It was a place of dishonor. And then they led him to another mount. It was Mount Calvary. Where does my help come from? So I looked to the hills. I looked to the mount. And it was on that mount, the place of the skull. It was on that garbage heap, a trash pile, a place of bones, a place where the greatest sinners were crucified. And it was here that Jesus would be crucified. I can't even imagine that. The sinless one among us sinners, crucified in the place where sinners were crucified. It was here while Jesus was dying on the cross and taking our sin upon Himself. It was here while Jesus took all of our shame and He took our, our humiliation upon Himself. It was here where Jesus said those famous words in the midst of all of that, Father, forgive them, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And it was here that Jesus, in drawing His last breath, cried out, It is finished. It is done. The work for salvation is done. No other work needs to be done. Jim, you can't do that work. You don't have to do that work. Take it easy in that respect. There's something called grace. The work of salvation has been done. And I thank God for that. And so I lift my eyes to the hills to the mountains, to Mount Calvary. And may we look to Mount Calvary today and let us cry out from our brokenness and from our shame and from our sin. Let us cry the words, Hosanna, Jesus, save us, save us now. And the wonderful thing is if you will cry that cry, save us, He will save you now in this moment. Cry to Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, oh, You are an awesome God, a loving God. Jesus, You who came to Jerusalem, You came as King, but You stopped on that mountain to weep over our sin, to weep over our separation, to weep over our bondage. Your heart was for us. And You entered Jerusalem triumphantly. And You exited to Jesus. Jesus, You exited triumphantly in all that excruciating pain and shame and humiliation. It was triumph. For he's at Mount Calvary. Jesus says you died and have risen where you have become victor and overcomer of sin and death. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. We cry to you now. We cry to you now. And Lord, if there's one just crying out that's never known you, I just pray they can come. They might come forward, might meet, and, and just open their heart to you and say, come in, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come in and be my Savior and Lord. I love you, Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.